Hi, this is Mark Graven. I am the VP of Improvement and Innovation Services at Kinexus, and I'm very happy to welcome you to today's webinar titled Leverage Lean for Long-Term Success Under Short-Term Pressures, which might very well uh, describe a lot of people in our audience, regardless of your industry or continent. We usually have people attending from all over the world, so I want to welcome you and, and thank you for joining us today. Our presenter is going to be uh, a special guest of ours, Warren Stokes. He's the Director of Process Improvement uh, for Honor Health, and uh, I'll give a little bit more formal introduction about Warren in a second. So our presenter today, Warren Stokes. I've, I've known Warren. Maybe when you start, Warren, you, you can remind me as you uh, kind of you know, introduce yourself. But we've known each other for a number of years. We've crossed paths at a number of uh, different events, and uh, we've been... Uh, very happy to have him in uh, the Kinexus family as a, a customer and a user of our system. He is uh, currently at Honor Health in Arizona. He has a BS in aeronautics, uh, aerospace science, and technology from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, an MA in public administration from Columbus State University, and uh, like me, Warren has a background originally in uh, manufacturing, so he's uh, worked for uh, Pratt & Whitney, Hamilton Sunstrand, uh, before that uh, was in the United States Air Force and uh, first got into healthcare uh, with Cancer Treatment Centers of America. So I'm really looking forward to the presentation. Uh, I've seen Warren talk about this topic uh, at uh, the site visit that we hosted uh, with Joe Schwartz at uh, the Franciscan St. Francis Health System, so I invited him to uh, expand upon that in the webinar. I think we're going to have a very uh, energetic, thought-provoking hour ahead. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Warren. Thanks for presenting today. Thank you, Mark. Uh, well, welcome, everyone, and good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're at in the world. And uh, as Mark said, we've known each other for a few years now, and uh, particularly I'd like to point out that uh, when I transitioned into healthcare from manufacturing, Mark was very instrumental uh, for me and my learning and uh, to begin my journey um, with some work he provided at Cancer Treatment Centers of America coming out and level setting with executives uh, for building out what a journey uh, for continuous improvement would look like. Uh, so that was very beneficial. And as most of you probably know, um, Mark is an author of many great books and resources for specifically continuous improvement and lean in healthcare, which have also helped a lot. So thanks again, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. So again, as Mark said, the, the title of this is Leveraging Lean um, for the Long Term While Under Short-Term Pressures. So some of the key learnings that we'll look at here is how to leverage your intellectual capital and experience of the frontline employees first before we start to go into and over-tool this situation, um, not over-complicating our improvements with too much of the scientific and not enough of the practical. Oftentimes, we want to bring out the, the most scientific and robust tools and methodologies uh, to get ourselves out of this situation. And uh, sometimes all we need is just that practical. Why it's important to build trust and support for continuous improvement, this is a risk in this situation being in the short term that if we do things differently in the short term than we would in the long term regarding lean or continuous improvement, we may start to build this uh, chasm of mistrust or distrust with our front line. We're going to look at how lean best fits into a larger, longer term strategy uh, while we're addressing these short-term pressures. So this is not an either-or. This is an, actually an add-on. This is an and. And then how leadership specifically and our lean teams, uh, if you have those at, uh, at your, your shops or in your hospitals or wherever you may be, how we can create and empower laser-focused energy. How are we going to do that? How we'll address all of those learnings today? It really follows this recipe. We're going to talk about the effective use of a lean language, uh, the simplicity of it, the practicality of it. We're going to talk about properly defining our problems. And um, we're going to talk about also executing with rapid cycles of improvement. And I'll break down each of these uh, and actually walk through a few tools that you can walk away from this webinar and implement immediately or start using immediately. So the theme here really 
We'll be viewing everything we talk about today and everything that you'll translate out into work with, uh, through the lens of simplicity and practicality. So here's the plot. And I'm certain everyone, this, this resonates with everyone. Everyone can uh, relate to this sort of situation, again, regardless of what industry you're in, is we have all of these outside forces. Uh, acting on us internally. We also have how we're set up internally to respond to those outside forces. Uh, these are economic pressures. These are, could be legal pressures, uh, policy-driven, technology, uh, change in the market. And what that causes for us, uh, perhaps we see a gap in our budget or a run rate to the gap uh, for a gap in the budget. Uh, demand may have decreased for us or volume has decreased. Uh, our prices may have increased. Uh, in fact, the supply chain may have increased in price. Uh, contracts may have changed. All of these create a situation where we're under pressure. And oftentimes, these become the short-term pressures rather than looking at this in the long view, uh, mainly due to our strategic planning and operational deployment processes. But that would be for an entirely different webinar altogether. Uh, so we're going to talk about finding ourselves in this situation of uh, dealing with the short-term pressures. Oftentimes, these are financial pressures. So with this impending uh, doom upon us here, we need immediate action. So uh, many of you may feel like, you know, hey, I've been a great supervisor, a great manager, a great leader. Um, I'm, you know, I, I've got our cell or our division or our department or function uh, in a better place than when I found it. Uh, we're doing all we can to uh, run a, a lean ship here and to uh, reduce costs, control expenses, maximize revenue. revenue. Um, so I'm not sure what to do now that we're in the short-term pressure. I'm being asked to reduce costs by 10, 20, 30 percent. Not sure where to get that from. Um, but I do know we're on this lean journey that uh, we've been speaking a lot about and we've, we've uh, committed to from a leadership standpoint and translated this and, uh, uh, throughout the entire organization. Um, and now I'm being told, hey, well, if, if, you know, if we're on this journey, why can't we just leverage that work that we're doing already? Uh, it may look like it'll take a little bit more time, but it's worth the, worth the investment. And perhaps we're being told, well, we're committed to lean, but just not right now. Right now, we don't have the time for that. Right now, we're, we're in the short term. We're under pressure. We have to do something immediately. And I'm not sure if that's familiar to anyone on the audience. I have, uh, in the audience, I have my suspicions. Uh, and by the way, I just noticed on this slide, I managed to include a plot and a twist with that Rubik's Cube. So what's our approach? Well, the approach here, again, as we talked about, uh, there should be no difference in the short term versus the long term in our commitment to lean. We should just be adding to our longer term strategy. Uh, so this is really a both and an and. It's not an either or. Um, we're also going to, there, there's a couple rules that uh, or principles that we would want to follow in order to be as successful as we can or as effective as we can uh, in the short term. And that's not to focus on the one fell swoop idea. Uh, oftentimes, if there is that one idea, it's either A, uh, too large of a risk for the uh, organization to uh, subscribe to at this time, or uh, B, if there were if there were that one fell swoop idea, we probably would have already implemented it. So we, we don't need to waste our time and energy on that one big idea. We also need to be mindful of organizational disruption as we are going through and, and improving or, or seeking cost reductions. Uh, this means really that everything we do, uh, as incremental or as large as it may be, has some sort of impact on the, the rest of the organization. Um, it will be a, uh, there will be a degree of disruption. It's a matter of how large that disruption is and how healthy that disruption is. So we've just got to be mindful of that as we, as we move through as well. And as our, uh, our friend Milton Friedman here said, he's a, uh, Nobel Prize winning economist. And uh, he stated that, you know, sometimes our solutions to a problem are as bad as the problems themselves. Uh, so we've got, again, we've got to make sure that we're not just trading one problem for another problem or an even worse problem. 
by the way, the both and 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 either or, those are called uh, correlative conjunctions. And I'll bet no one thought that, uh, or no one believed their grammar school teacher when they said you'd be using these someday, even if it's just seeing it on this slide. I'm assuming everyone's laughing right now, so I'll pause and let you catch your breath. I, I had myself muted, Warren, so maybe that's why. Sorry, I fell in for feedback. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. So, okay, so now, you know, if we, if we take a look at this, we've got our plot, we've got our theme, what, how we're going to approach this through simplicity and practicality. Um, and we need to know what our opportunity is. What does that look like, okay, when we talk about being able to reduce costs in the short term? Well, typically what an organization looks like is, you know, there's already fruit on the ground that we just need to grab. And it, this is a roughly equates to a rough, around 10%. Um, what would be equated to 10% cost reduction on the whole. And this is really utilizing our frontline knowledge, the people that are doing these things every day, the people that know their, their work through and through, they know this based off of in, uh, you know, the improvements based off of intuition and experience. So it's just there. Uh, the low hanging fruit, or what we would categorize as operational risks, uh, and that, that accounts for roughly 20%. Um, of our cost currently in the system, and, and I'll go through and expand on what operational risks are. And then uh, the upper fruit there, the bulk of the fruit, this is typically 30% or so of, uh, of our cost in the system, and this would really require some sort of process restructure where we're including multiple departments and cross functions. So we'll go through each of these and, and how, we, uh, how we leverage each level of this, uh, of the fruit tree there. Well, the first step before we even get into planning uh, and picking the fruit or picking up the fruit is to align. And this is really a message to leadership. Uh, we need to align and we need to align quickly. And how we do that is we need to understand our true current state, meaning that uh, it's not just uh, anecdotal and it's not hearsay. Uh, we need to truly understand what's going on. We need to actually ask ourselves if we can trust the data that we're seeing come across or that's being posted every day. Uh, with the intention that we've got to be, we, we've got to fully understand our problem. So it's not that we don't trust people to give us the right data. It's have we set them up in the right way, given them the, the correct mechanisms? Uh, do we have a single source of truth? Um, and are the reports that are generated that we see and we base our decisions off of, uh, is there actually integrity behind it itself? And again, we would need to know this so we can actually know which problem to work on. Uh, so we want to focus on our key business drivers, and I do mean key. Uh, this shouldn't be a set of 20 or 30 different uh, business drivers or metrics. We, know, we need to look at those critical few that are driving our business or reflecting our business. Uh, we need to go into there and validate the definitions and calculations. So what do we mean when we say turnaround time or length of stay? or on-time starts. Uh, validate the definition and then validate how we're calculating. Uh, if the calculation comes from more than one department, are we calculating the same way in, in all departments? Um, there, there's oftentimes exceptions to calculations. Uh, and sometimes we take liberties with those exceptions. Again, all with the best intention, perhaps it's how we were we were taught, or perhaps it was what we did at the time and we never got the revision. Uh, but we need to ensure that we're all using the same set of rules for exceptions. For example, if you have uh, an on-time start percentage in, a, in a, an operating room and it's showing 90% in, in, in one area or one hospital and 30% in another hospital, we need to understand if that's truly reflective of the work that's happening, uh, the demand and how we respond to that, um, or is there also more to the story in the way of, you know, maybe perhaps this hospital doesn't include um, those things they deem outside of their control. So supplies weren't ready, it's on the vendor, so I'm not going to count that against our utilization. Um, with that being said, we need to take our data that we are receiving, that we see even after we, after we validate it, and we can trust the data, we need to turn that into information. So data itself is fine, but as you can see in the picture there, it's like a bunch of pieces of puzzle. If we don't know what picture those puzzles are supposed to, 
to show us or to reveal, it's harder for us to make decisions. So really the question here is we need to put context around uh, that data, turn it into information, information that we can make decisions off of or insight. So we ask ourselves, okay, th we have this data. Well, so what? What happens with it? Uh, well, we need to search for con or context. We need to seek that out. And oftentimes, by the way, when we talk about engaging the front line, that's where we would find it. And then pictureize or visualize the data with that information. Again, that data within context. Uh, that will align everyone around the table, everyone in the, uh, the organization with uh, a laser focus on what we're trying to accomplish or where our challenges lie. Another piece of this would be prioritization. Once we understand what those key business drivers are and once we understand uh, you know, the, the picture and the context uh, of what this data is showing us, we want to prioritize because we can't focus on everything, especially in the short term. So a simple tool here, uh, and again, maybe you have a tool in your organization, maybe you don't. This is just a very simple variation of what's called a failure modes and effect analysis. Uh, where you're looking at two, uh, on the two axes here, you have the frequency or the likelihood of, of something happening, whether it be a fault or whether it be an event, and then you have at the bottom the impact. Okay, so we have something that happens, how does it impact us, uh, whether it be in time or dollars or however else uh, makes sense for you to measure that to assign it a proper impact. Now that impact would be against the scope of those key business drivers. Again, we want to follow through those key business drivers. These are the most critical right now, the critical few, and we want to see how they're impacted. So we want to, we want to attempt at quantifying that. We spoke about the data in the previous slide, and now we're looking at quantifying either, even further in the impact it has on the organization. Now this can be however you need to slice it to make sense again for your organization, but this could be by program, this could be by process function, equipment. Uh, you may just see different categories as you see there with the rework or the scrap or the downtime. All of these could be examples of uh, frequency of occurrences, events, or failure modes, and then quantifying the impact on our key business drivers. An interesting note is that uh, an average cost of poor quality which, by the way, the rework, repair, and scrap, those would all be considered a cost associated with poor quality, meaning we didn't uh, have the product or service flow through 100% the first time. And that average cost is typically around 15% of sales. So you could just imagine that when again, whether it be long-term or short-term, but especially under these short-term pressures, if we have roughly 15% of our top-line sales, uh, represented as uh, as waste or poor quality throughout our system, this should be part of that low-hanging fruit or the fruit that you pick right up, 15% right off the top. So a million in sales, there's 150 grand right there. And you can see on that prioritization scale, really, it's, again, just very simple. Uh, low frequency or low impact, medium, and high. Part of uh, leadership's role here is to create the right energy. Okay, We want to get everyone focused, and we want to get everyone in the mindset. There's already anxiety, uh, and it's already a stress-filled uh, environment with these short-term pressures. So uh, leadership really has the, the, the responsibility of creating the right energy around this activity uh, to get us in a healthier position, and that's both process and morale. And so part of what they would do, uh, a very critical part of what they would do, is provide the clarity around the situation. So we need to make this crystal clear, and we need to be very specific about the situation we're in. Well, that entails us using an effective language um, and bringing visibility or light to our challenges uh, ahead of us. And it's also not just focusing on one level of the organization, perhaps the middle managers or uh, executive leadership, but this is engaging at all levels. This is, uh, you know, this is really building that esprit de corps. Uh, this is all hands on deck. This is a mindset, level setting everyone in a mindset in the organization. So we need to engage at all levels. Well, part of uh, clarity 
and engaging at the seven, at the uh, at all levels in creating this right energy is actually going to enable us to capitalize on the right energy. So in a more concise way to say it is create the right energy to capitalize on the right energy. And that right energy at the end being this is the intellectual capital that we'll get from our front line and from our, our, our leaders. So if we set the right context and scope and clarity um, and the right mindset around the, the challenges we're in right now, we in turn will be able to capitalize on all of that energy um, and effort that our, our stakeholders are putting into it. So when we do approach at all levels and engage at all levels, um, and specifically when we're focused in a, uh, an area that's having more challenges than others, uh, there could cause some skepticism and uh, a bit of uh, trust issues from the stakeholders. Why, are, why is leadership coming to us? Uh, why are they looking at our area? Have we done something wrong? They may feel a sense of uh, being targeted. Um, and so we really, if, if they're viewing it in that way and in increased anxiety, this is going to, uh, they're going to disengage further and we're not going to be able to capitalize on that, uh, on the, all of that experience and that knowledge that they have. Uh, they won't be as motivated as they, uh, as they would have been with the right energy. We won't be picking up the discretionary effort that they may be giving, um, rather than just doing their eight. Uh, eight hours or doing, you know, that, that daily production demand. So we want to make sure, again, that we're very specific and we let them know why, why we're here, what we're talking about, exactly what are these challenges that we're facing. Again, recall, we already did uh, the due diligence with identifying the proper data, turning that into information, creating visuals out of that, and we really want to get our entire, uh, all of our levels, all of our stakeholders aligned to that. We want to avoid generic phrases. So in our specificity, we don't want to come in with, you know, uh, these phrases like maybe you've heard or perhaps you've, you've said yourself sometimes or, well, we're just going to have to do more with less. Uh, that's not the message uh, that we bring if we're trying to really capitalize on that, that appropriate energy or that healthy energy. Um, work smarter, not harder. This could this could actually um, further a divide with our stakeholders uh, as uh, it can be taken as insulting. Uh, well, I've been working smarter this whole time, you know. Um, I've also been working harder this whole time. What do you mean? So the, really the onus is on us as leaders uh, to set that stage appropriately with clarity and with specificity to actually engage rather than disengage our stakeholders. Also in the lean world, as if you are fortunate enough to have a continuous improvement department or a continuous improvement team or perhaps the competencies just built in, we have to be very mindful uh, if we want to be effective. Uh, so our language of lean, for example, you know, it shouldn't be taken as, you know, Cobra Kai, as you see here, and we're all black belts. This is how we speak. This is what we do. That can be oftentimes intimidating. Um, not intimidating in the way of, you know, oh, I'm not as smart as you, but intimidating in the way of, wow, you know, we're just on two different pages. I'm not sure what you're speaking about. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know if we can find a common ground here. I'm going to go and, you know, do my work, and you're going to work on whatever you just told me, whatever those words were. Uh, furthermore, if we were Cobra Kai, Cobra Kai here, I do believe after our long ramble of Lean Speak, we may catch a, a crane kick right to where we spoke it out of. Again, I'll pause for laughter. Okay, moving forward on the effective language of lean. The reality is, language of lean is not one, there, there is a universal uh, lexicon. And we see this in, you know, books and value stream mapping, perhaps. We see the Toyota production system. That is true. However, if we're trying to be as effective as possible within our own organization, well, the language of lean is the language of your organization. Um, and it's up to us to bridge that divide. Uh, what we don't want to do is create a new barrier while we're in these short-term pressures. And now we've actually, we're trying to teach people a whole other language while we're trying to also get them to problem solve. Imagine if, you're, uh, if your doctor, your physician, uh, spoken nothing but technical jargon to you. 
that, that's all they spoke to you in. Um, and really what you want to know is, what is it, uh, if, it's a, if it's a cold, if it's a flu, what should I do about it? But if they're only speaking in the technical jargon, again, we have a divide and we're not able to work together. So just quickly, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, these words, heard these words, used these words. It's just an example of what that might look like. So what we go out and say, you know, hey, find the Mura, find the Murray, find the Muda. Uh, you know, implement a Kanban. Why don't we just introduce Hijunka? Well, that's what we say, but what we actually mean, or over to the right here, you know, we're really talking about uh, where is the waste and, and how we define that waste in our organization? Where's the work actually happening? Um, how do we smooth out the workload and balance the workload better? This, is, this resonates more with everyone because it's saying this is actually what we're trying to do rather than, you know, uh, using lean jargon. Again, I'm not saying it's completely, uh, there's no place for uh, the lexicon of lean. That's a universal lexicon because uh, we could go to any organization and all connect with that type of language and be on the same page immediately. So there's benefit there. What I'm saying is if you want to be very effective, um, you'll probably create your own language or your own lexicon driven by the organization and, uh, and the language that they're used to. Okay, so now we move on. Now we, we've got aligned, and we're all speaking a, uh, a very clean, crisp, clear language with each other. We're all on the same page. So now it's time to do work. Well, how do we get that work done? Well, we, you saw the opportunity, uh, the 10, 20, and 30% on a few slides ago. So we'll begin with this 10% and how we address it. Well, these are what I'm just saying, just grab it. It's fruit on the ground already. All we have to do is just pick it up, put it in the basket. And how we do that is we really leverage our front line. Again, this is uh, tapping into their intuition and to their knowledge and experience. We should be able to pick that 10% up, no problem. The key is opening up or removing that barrier for them and opening up the gates, allowing the flood of their, of their ideas, probably that they've they've had for many years or for, for quite some time and allowing for that to flow okay now these will be uh, to be sure uh, very incremental ideas um, but while as they all add up again we can see the cumulative of roughly 10 percent which is quite large in some and by the way this also builds uh, the morale this builds the trust it builds empowerment uh, among the team and motivation, especially in this time under the short-term pressures. And again, as we spoke about data turning into information earlier, this is usually where your source of information is. When we talked about having data and asking the so what behind that, typically this is where we can go and grab it because these frontline stakeholders, again, have the knowledge, they have the experience, they've seen it. Um, perhaps they're doing a workaround today uh, based off of something that they've, they've brought up, you know, many, many months ago. And all it takes is us to just go ask or go observe and work together. So now on to the 20%. And by the way, on that 10%, on that 10%, just let all the ideas flow. Uh, don't put any boundaries around that or any barriers around that. That doesn't have to be in the specific focus area of the, uh, you know, the top three priorities. That can just be spread throughout the ent entire organization. This is what we call uh, bottoms up improvement, incremental improvement. And it actually, um, this will be one of your constants in holding to an operating system. Uh, no matter how many changes an organization goes through, this is truly the spirit of it. So moving on to the 20% now, now, these are what we call low-hanging fruit, and perhaps, again, that, that's a tired phrase, but um, as it's represented here, this would be an operational risk. So this is where we really focus on the waste itself. Um, again, recall COPQ, or cost of poor quality, is roughly 15% of sales, and that cost of poor quality translates into or is driven from one of our eight wastes. Uh, another piece of this would be meetings. You know, how much are we tying up our current talent? How much are we over-processing with all of these meetings? You know, we're expecting our, um, our leadership to go out, and especially on the front line, to go out and problem solve uh, and to get results 
during this time, uh, yet we're pulling them away from there and putting them into meetings. Uh, so we'll talk about that. And then aligning your daily management to ensure, again, uh, that we're optimizing this or leveraging this as much as possible. So the waste that we spoke about, you know, with that cost of poor quality would fall largely into one of these eight buckets. I'm certain everyone has seen this before. If not, here you go. This is a great breakdown uh, with definitions of the waste that you typically see in both the manufacturing and service industry. Uh, we may have some slightly different words for it, but by and large, this is, this is the waste that would be inherent in, uh, in processes in any industry. Um, and a great acronym, downtime, help you remember that. Uh, the meetings, though, as you can see on this visual, uh, middle managers, roughly 35% of their time, upper management, 50% of their time, spent in meetings. Okay? And now, this is not even in the short term. This is just you know, all things remaining equal, any given day, any given year, this is roughly uh, the impact or the number that we see in the way of the time dedicated to meetings alone from both our middle managers and upper managers. And now, because we're in this crisis mode and we're trying to uh, fix everything we can, we're going to want to see, you know, updates. We're going to want to see action plans, how we're progressing, how long it's going to take, so what do we do? we increase the number of meetings. So we're already overtaxing, we're already uh, decreasing productivity and human talent uh, by our normal operations of meetings, and now we're going to increase that. Uh, because again, we need those updates. Well, that's just, that's cash, more cash, right out the window, right out the door, um, because we're not allowing those leaders, and especially those frontline leaders, to be out there problem solving, removing barriers, and driving uh, the improvement that we need at that time. So, if we can free up their time, if we can free their time up from the meetings and get them focused more on problem solving, how would we do that? Well, we need our visual indicators. Rather than being in a conference room, if we have everything visual that we all can align to and that we all can see, then we're not going to need a, a table uh, where a visual board or going out to the, uh, the actual place of work is. So, but in order to do that, we've got to narrow and focus our attention, okay? Um, we can't be looking at uh, 100 different indicators. As I said earlier, this has got to be the, the key business indicators that we're focused on at this time. Um, for instance, uh, and this should be maybe two to three to maybe four. Uh, for example, uh, let's say uh, you're in an organization, and uh, let's just call them let's call them Ken. Uh, every day you ask, "Hey Ken," or every month you ask, "Hey Ken." So where are we at? Uh, what do we have? How many initiatives? How many key metrics? And Ken's response is always, "Oh, I got five to seven, five to seven. Okay, and it never changes. It never changes. Um, we have to ask ourselves at some point, you know, with five to seven. Are we actually spread out a bit too thin? So we've got a lot of things in work, but are we getting anything done or accomplished in a timely manner? And by the way, is five to seven too much where really we'd be more impactful focusing with a very narrow focus on two to three? So in order to really realize that, we would, make it, we would wanna make it as visible as possible. This is a dashboard. This is a crash board. In the situation we're in now, and as a matter of fact, I would propose in any situation, short term or long term, we would want to look more like the left. Now, again, different levels require different, uh, different reporting, uh, different indications to understand, um, you know, again, the different maybe processes, functions, uh, even sites, how, how an industry or how a, a business is running. But by and large, when we're looking at, you know, where our focus goes, how we, uh, where we put our attention. It would more often look like the left. Again, imagine the right being in, as you're driving. Imagine paying attention to that. Uh, it, it takes our focus completely away from uh, the critical few, right? And as a matter of fact, it adds more waste and confusion to our process. Uh, it, it overwhelms us, it tires us out. So again, this is about taking everything we just talked about 
focusing it down to the narrow view and making it visual, something everyone can align to. We should post this on our daily management system. If you have a daily management system or a visual system, um, we would post it with the data and the information. Again, what's the data telling us? But again, very simply, as we talk about the dashboard versus the crash board. So what a dashboard would look like in this case is something that anyone could come by, especially anyone uh, that's accountable or responsible, so from upper leadership to middle management to a stakeholder, and they would be able to understand what's happening at any given time uh, with that cell, with that product line, with that department or function. Uh, we don't want to waste a lot of time uh, or introduce a lot of time with uh, building reports, more reporting. Okay, um, We want to make this very simple. We want to make this very visual because while we're, while we're uh, seeking to eliminate waste and cost, we don't want to get in the, the situation where we're actually adding waste and cost, again, with the meetings, with the reporting. <clears throat> One way uh, simply to do this, and again, with your metrics board and to be able to manage some of your projects, uh, quote unquote projects, um, in this 20% of operational risks is to storyboard. Or maybe some of you recognize this as an A3. Uh, by the way, um, piece of trivia with A3. Uh, the reason why it's called A3, it's not an acronym with three A's. It's the size of the paper that in Toyota that, uh, that they used uh, to storyboard out problem solving. So the storyboarding, it can be very, very effective uh, with engagement of frontline uh, because it is very simple. Um, and, and with that simplicity, it's very empowering and it's very motivational. As you see, this will be you know, nothing fancy. You can do this electronically if you like, or you could do this just handwritten and posted on the board. This allows everyone to package what's my current state, what am I doing about it, what was the result? And so as you see the step-by-step -step here, I'll take you through one of these. If the problem we're feeding the baby, you know, we say, okay, what's our current condition, our problem statement? You see a lot of information there, the relevant information there. Uh, you see at the bottom your total times, 8.2 hours spent per week uh, to feed and clean up after baby number three. So that's our current condition. That's our problem statement. Step two, we go through and we say, okay, well, what do I need to get to? What am I driving toward? What are my goals? Uh, step three, what's preventing me? What are the actual causes of uh, the current condition and the problem statement that I have? Uh, what am I going to put in place to mitigate that? So what are my actions? And then finally, um, I need to validate uh, were, my, were my actions or countermeasures effective? Um, so this would be in verify and standardize, and as you can see, went from 8.2 hours per week um, and saved 6.4 hours per week. Um, so now we're just down to 1.8. Uh, and again, you can see that's all handwritten. I know it's sort of a, a silly uh, example, uh, but the concept here that this is just a very simple visual tool for problem solving and then to be able to post this and share this, um, not only for reasons of, hey, look what we did, this is great, this is motivational because we made an impact, it's also others can learn from this. How do we know how many other people in the organization um, are or are not experiencing our same problem? And now all they have to do is replicate. So moving on to the 30%, okay, so the bulk here. Now this takes quite a bit more work. Um, it doesn't mean that it has to take so much longer, but it is more work and more detailed work. Uh, two, two keys to understand here when restructuring are, have we really truly defined and understood our requirements from our customer? And that could mean your external customer, so who eventually receives your product or service. It could also mean your internal customers. So here, your internal customers would fit in what's called a value stream. Who are you receiving from and who are you handing off to? Okay, and oftentimes these are cross-functional, multi-departmental. Um, so we'll begin with, though, first understanding what your requirements are. And uh, at least in my experience, um, now I'm not sure others' opinions or, or, or experience on this, that oftentimes it's the communication uh, that I see in a process that is the number one driver for whether it be rework 
or whether it be uh, longer turnaround times or processing time. And that communication oftentimes drives back to uh, the supplier and the customer not fully understanding what is, what is expected from each. And so the tool that I'll take you through now actually aligns us to exactly that. This is a very simple tool called a SIPOC that is truly fundamental on everything we do. Um, again, this is not just the short term. If you start to implement this in the short term, I assure you, you will carry this on through the organization, even always through your long-term strategy as well. Uh, but how it works, if you look at a SIPOC as an acronym, uh, and you can see that stands for Suppliers, Inputs, Process, Outputs, and Customer. Um, and, and with that, uh, I also include some metrics on there. Um, this is a template that I often use. You're, you're welcome to find your own. Uh, but how we would walk through that is step one, identify your process. Step two, so what am I doing? Step two, what comes out of that process? Step three, who is it going to? Now I need to align with my customer in step four of what do they need, how do they need it, when do they need it? Well, in order to do that, in order to make good on those outputs to that customer, I need certain inputs. I'm going to need those from suppliers and I'm gonna let them know when I need it and how I need it. So again, here's just an example of what a SIPOC would look like. You can apply this to any process in your organization. And this gets you 100% aligned with your customers and your suppliers. By the way, if you're including the metrics, you should look how much rework is included, how often or not often are these things actually happening. Also part of the value stream would be to scope chunk appropriately. Okay, so don't take everything on at one time. As we're looking at this, okay, we see in this value stream uh, for perioperative or uh, where we're doing some sort of OR procedure, we're gonna focus only on reducing our process time in our pre-anesthesia clinic that we just saw in the SIPOC uh, by 30%, and we should really chunk these out to about two week rapid cycles of improvement. When we look at those rapid cycles of improvement, again, bring the storyboards back in. Take the A3s, each chunk, uh, and each scope would have its own A3. Um, you would make that visible as you're tracking it on your daily management, and then just run them through the Plan, Do, Check, Act cycles, okay? So again, visual and simple, uh, two-week rapid cycle, okay? And then go back and see if it's sustaining. We don't wanna take on too much. So where do you go from here? Well, leaders, this is a, specifically for leaders. You need to be visible. As all of this work that we just walked through, the tools and the, uh, the visuals, uh, as it's getting out there, we need to be visible and we need to show support, we need to remove barriers, and we need to be part of the process of continuous improvement, especially in the short term, because it will build the trust. It'll build the trust that we're committed to lean and continuous improvement, not just when it's uh, quote unquote convenient or when we can afford to. Uh, don't don't go to a conference table where a walk will do. So again, uh, that you, but you would need to have a visual system for that. Some of the visuals that we walked over in this presentation, uh, what we would call making markers instead of meetings. And at the end of the day, the moral of the story, uh, if I had to sum it up here, would be um, if you've heard the fable of the crow in the pitcher, the crow's looking for water, sees an urn. Uh, but the water level is low in the urn. So that crow could have flown off and, and found something where water level was higher and not as hard to get to. Uh, but the crow took one small pebble at a time and dropped it in to the urn until it raised the water level to where uh, his thirst was quenched. And so the point here is that the small improvements do add up and where there's a will, there's a way. And as a matter of fact, when we said in the beginning, uh, we're committed to lean when we can afford to be. The fact is that we can't afford not to be lean, especially in the short term. Well, thank you, Warren, for, uh, for your presentation and for your thoughts uh, and everything today. Questions are uh, starting to come in, so I'll encourage people uh, to continue submitting questions while we're waiting for those to come in. I have just a couple of quick announcements. I don't know if anyone attending has ever uh, seen heard one of the Ask Us Anything uh, video webinars that Greg Jacobson and I do, but we are doing episode 14 in that series uh, next week, uh, Tuesday the 15th uh, at 1 Eastern. You can register for this and you can submit questions 
via kinexus.com slash webinars. Um, we, we, it, it's about a 30-minute format. Every time uh, we do this, it's questions from people uh, in our Kinexus community. And if anyone wants to check past episodes of the Ask Us Anything, those are available on our Kinexus YouTube channel. So that's one thing you might want to check out. Our next presentation webinar is going to be at the end of the month, August 30th. We're going to be joined by uh, three co-presenters. Laura Townsend, who I, I know very well from um, down here in Texas. She is the co-founder and president of a nonprofit called the Louise H. Batts Patient Safety Foundation. Um, she is going to be presenting on the topic of teaming with patients to improve patient safety. That is a big part of their work at the Bats Foundation. Um, Laura, in the webinar, will will tell the story of uh, um, you know the, the unfortunate patient safety mishap story that led to the creation of the foundation and the good work they are doing to partner with clinicians. Yeah, I would encourage people to attend, whether you work in healthcare or whether you are a patient or a family member. Um, the really great stuff that the foundation is doing. And we have some other resources, the Kinexus blog at blog.kinexus.com, um, a lot of other resources at our website. And we also have our podcast. So uh, Warren's webinar, my mispronunciations, uh, everything there will be captured. The audio will be shared through our podcast feed. That was actually an idea that came from one of our Kinexus customers. And we have all sorts of other uh, content in the podcast feed, um, including that Ask Us Anything series, uh, Connexus team members reading blog posts in audiobook format, things like that. So you can find that at kinexus.com slash podcast or through any of your favorite podcast directories. And if you have further Q&A, here is Warren's email address. And uh, let's just jump into, we've got about 12 minutes for questions. Um, Question from Ismelda, and, and you might maybe follow up and uh, elaborate or clarify the question here, but um, what she asked was, how would you apply this when you are an area manager, as a leader, when you travel around? So maybe the situation here is somebody who has more than just one site. If it's a healthcare manager driving to different clinics and hospitals, somebody who has multiple factories in their domain, I'm assuming that's that's what the question is. What, what are some of your thoughts there, Warren? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, the reality is I don't think you would approach it any differently, uh, whether it be a, a cell or a department or uh, multi-site. Now, what you may do is rely more heavily on some of the tools like the value stream approach. And uh, out of that, you know, uh, driving an overall a higher level dashboard uh, rather than just a department dashboard. You may have one that is the cumulative of uh, the same process in each of these sites. Um, so that would give you a visual indication of how you're doing. You would still want to focus on the very critical few metrics, and then also you would benefit from uh, being able to standardize or spread and share uh, some of the learnings that are happening at, uh, at the different sites with the others. Um, so it actually, it, it sounds like a lot more work to do, but you actually get quite a bit of an advantage there in being able to gain traction and realize benefits quicker uh, by being able to um, take the learnings and putting it into multiple sites if you have the same type of processes. But again, you should, and with the, uh, the energy, you should be creating the same type of energy um, at every single one of those sites. Okay, um, another question here. Early, uh, thank you from Ismelda, so hopefully that was the, uh, the crux of the question. Um, there's a question from Tom. It says, we've done pretty much what you have outlined today with local successes, but I don't see organizational transformation. All the employees I talk to have, who have done lean initiatives rave about how, how well they went. Then I ask, have you continued the improvement? And many shrug and say no, insert, excuse of the day here. What, what are some of your thoughts on that, Warren? Yeah, and, uh, another great question and very uh, very familiar probably to a lot of people. Uh, you know, I think first it would be uh, how do you define transformation? How do you define transformation and how do you define journey? Um, 
and then taking that and breaking it down into what's our commitment to that because what I heard described there is a lack of sustainment. There was a lot of focus, a lot of energy around something at a time, and everyone came together um, and, and saw some success. But then, you know, maybe the, the environment changed, um, and we saw that to start to dwindle. And perhaps even the improvements we put in place did not sustain. So this would be, again, when we're bridging the gap between long-term uh, sustainability under short-term pressures, this is why it should look no different, why we should be committed and doing the same things in the short-term and the long-term. So you may see a large uh, presence of leadership and focus um, during the short term, and again, that may fall off once we get a bit com more comfortable, uh, but that shouldn't. We should incorporate that into our daily routine or our weekly routine, whatever frequency works. We should, we should uh, continue to leverage the visuals, and we should continue to leverage the energy and the focus from our front line. So this does take a lot of work and a lot of commitment, uh, but what you'll find is you'll eventually get to a point um, where you reach critical mass, and again, the operating system is in, in full motion. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned um, lack of sustainment. I also detect, you know, lack of focus on management systems and culture change, right? So in the short term, organizations might use training tools, projects, events, and hopefully that leads to longer term um, change. But, you know, I think we've all seen there are so many organizations that are only focusing on kind of the, the quick, relatively simple changes, and it's not sparking... Um, the, the more complicated, arguably more important changes to those early dimensions that would, you know, create not just uh, sporadic projects, but a culture of continuous improvement. I think that really is a culture. It's not just a matter of training people how to do improvement. The culture has to encourage it every day, I would, I would, I would add. Yeah, no, I, I think... Um... I think that's a great point, Mark. It, it would be translated into, you know, where we look at the short term and especially uh, what you saw through this through this uh, webinar and probably what many are experiencing. In the short term, we're focused on a lot of tools and methodologies. Um, we're trying to incorporate the right mindset, but our primary focus is at, on those tools at that time because it's solving the immediate or the acute issue. And I think what you described is actually, you know, we always have to make sure we come back to on that culture piece. That's not about the competence or about the tool set. That's really about the mindset. And again, that's carrying on, uh, you know, um, moving from that tool-driven environment more to the mindset-driven and competency-driven mind, uh, mindset uh, and spirit for the long term. So another question here from Jeff. There's a strong preference by the senior people to act very quickly on ideas instead of spending time collecting data or identifying inputs. How do you get people who are used to command and control approaches, how do you get them to take a more analytical approach? And, and I'll just add as, as part of the question for you to respond to, Warren, I, I hear a lot of times people say, oh, we're, oh, we're, we're great problem solvers, when they really <laughs> maybe being more honest about it, they are great at jumping to solutions, which is, I, I think, a different, uh, a different thing altogether. What, what are your thoughts on, on the question or my addition to it? Yeah, I, I believe this would go back to uh, turning data into information. So, you know, getting people to be more analytical, there needs to be a value behind it. Somewhere there's a value that's being missed uh, for those uh, for those people in the organization. And so perhaps it's because, you know, and, and I'm not sure what the cause is in your situation, Jeff, but perhaps some of the causes that, you know, we have a lot of data, we have a lot of numbers, uh, but again, there's that so what behind it. There's not really context or what are we going to do with it? So it's really turning that data analyzing it in the appropriate way and turning it into information to where they are now empowered uh, to make a decision, uh, an effective decision out of that. So um, it's true we need to be analytical, but it's also, this is, this is why, you know, now we see Lean Six Sigma rather than the old days where we just had Lean Manufacturing and we had Six Sigma, is because there's a time and place for, for each and there's a time and place for both. Um, you know, where lean, where you have the immediate waste and, and we, you know, we can focus directly in on that because we see it in front of us um, and we can remove that from the system. Uh, 
At the same time, we have Six Sigma that, that does bring more of an analytical uh, aspect to this and say, no, you know, uh, what does our quality look like and to what degree um, are we trying to achieve our quality and how do we know where we're at today? How do we know where we need to be? We need that clarity in our data. So, but even if, we're repro even if we're producing all of these reports with all of this great data, we need to put that puzzle together. Uh, again, harkening back to that slide, turn it into information and you'll find a lot more value out of it because you'll make decisions off of it. Yeah, and, and I think even, and I'm with you, there's an and here, it could be Lean and Six Sigma, but I think even within the context of Lean, there's a time and a place for the relatively quick just do it, where you know, we, we have something that we go and test in practice in, in a spirit of plan, do, study, adjust. And then there's, you know, deeper, stickier problems where we might use an A3 or a structured problem solving methodology for. So um, I, I think it's, you know, either way, I think it's and, not or. Uh, you know, my own view, it's not, should we do Kaizen events or daily improvement? It, it's an and. And, you know, I, I thank you, Warren, for bringing up that idea of, of not either or, but and. Um, Absolutely. One question. Is a, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, Miss Kreinenberg from my seventh grade grammar, she, she'll be proud. <laughs> um, you, in one slide, Warren, it says you, uh, you mentioned 15% cost of poor quality. Is that a general business number? Is that a healthcare number? Can you give a little more detail? Yeah, no, great question. And again, there's many sources for this. I know I didn't include it on there, but. Um, it's that's in general that's overall and as a matter of fact the original studies came from uh, mostly manufacturing environments but now we're seeing them make their way into healthcare um the cost of poor quality actually has not gained the inertia um in healthcare or other service industries like you see in manufacturing so um if you do a quick search you'll find you know at length study after study breaking down cost of poor quality <clears throat> in a manufacturing environment yeah, and I think, you know, especially, uh, you know, there's, there's such big opportunity for this in healthcare. The traditional healthcare approach to cost cutting has really focused on labor costs, which means layoffs, which might have, I'm getting on my soapbox here, um, could lead to, to quality that's worse, as opposed to taking the lessons from Dr. Deming and others in healthcare who learned from Dr. Deming, you know, the, advocating that, you know, quality reduction leads to lower cost and, and arguably quality, did I say quality reduction, quality defect reduction. Defect right. reduction, quality improvement, I misspoke again. Uh, that defect reduction is the best way to get uh, lower cost. So well, well, and to I'll, your I'll point let you have there. the last word on that topic, Warren. Yeah, well, thank you, because it's a great segue um, and a great ending, I think, for this topic, Mark, is what you described about labor costs. That's often when we find ourselves in these short-term uh, pressure situations. We take a look at the pie. The largest uh, piece is labor, um, overhead. Okay, so, you know, everyone attack. Go there um, and look at labor. Where can we reduce labor? <clears throat> when... Uh, if we take a step back as leaders and say, okay, labor may be our largest, but how are we using our current labor? How are we leveraging our current labor? Are we having them spend the majority of their time reworking or running around or over-processing, um, uh, producing defective parts, uh, which gets back to what you were talking about, defect management, uh, Mark. If we took a step back and looked at how we're utilizing our labor, our talent today, we may have a different perspective and a different plan of how we reduce reduced overall costs rather than, you know, reductions in force. Yeah. All right. Well, we are, it is top of the hour. We are uh, out of time here, but I want to thank everybody for attending and staying on during the Q&A. Um, I want to thank Warren, uh, Warren Stokes, Director of Process Improvement from Honor Health for being our presenter today. Warren, thank you so much for uh, doing the presentation today. Oh, well, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Um, yeah, wish you all well. <laughs> Likewise, so on, on behalf of the entire team at Kinexus, this has been Mark Graven. Um, thanks again for joining us today.